Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist at The Post. My guest today on our continuing series, The Path Forward, is Michael Dell, the chairman and chief executive of Dell Technologies. Michael has just published a new book called Play Nice But Win, a CEO's journey from founder to leader. It's just been released today. Uh, Welcome to Washington Post Live, Michael. Thank you, David. Great to be with you. Good to be with you. Let, let's start by trying to get our minds around the fact that you started this company, Dell Computer Corporation, its predecessor, when you were a 19-year-old college student. So it's 1984. You're sitting in your dorm room at the University of Texas. You decide to launch this company. As I read the book, you'd actually been running a company for a while. Tell us how this story happened, how this rocket ship first took off. Well, it was it was the dawn of the microprocessor age, and you know I was super interested in technology and computers and and also business, and really saw uh, what looked like an incredible opportunity. You know, and uh, I started uh, pretty simply upgrading the the IBM personal computers, were, which were available at the time, and. You know, it it uh, became a became a real business, and I I saw op- an opportunity to turn it into a company. I d- had no idea what it would become, uh, you know, even five or ten years later, or certainly not thirty seven years later. But uh, you know, the the idea that anybody could have access to a PC, and that you know you could program it yourself, uh, you know, to me was incredibly enticing. And I saw some inefficiencies in the way these were being sold and and uh, delivered to customers and, you know, thought there was a better way. You write in the book that when you were a a teenager where uh, other kids uh, were crazy about playing sports, uh, you were really good at and enjoyed making money uh, and that you uh, began uh, to go on what you call fly and buy trips to, to purchase computers that you could then uh, reconfigure and resell. Just t- tell us a little bit about that. That's that's not the usual teenage experience. So uh, in 1981, when IBM first introduced the PC, uh, it started to take off pretty quickly. And what you would happen, w- what you would have is, uh, you know, a dealer in one city would uh, order a thousand computers, and you know maybe they'd get a thousand, or maybe they'd get a hundred because they they were on allocation. And so some of the dealers started to order more than they needed, and occasionally they would get them. And so it was a really inefficient uh, system. And so you you have sort of too many computers in one city and not enough in another. And so I discovered this arbitrage opportunity, and on the weekends. I would. Uh, I did this when I was in college. When I was a freshman in college, uh, called it called it fly and buys, and I, you know, get on Southwest Airlines and fly to a relatively nearby city uh, with with a cashier's check, and you know, buy 50 or so of these machines. Uh, you know, rent a U-Haul truck, which amazingly you could do when you were 18 years old back then, and uh, and I drive them to another city. And sell them for maybe fifty or seventy or eighty dollars more per machine to another dealer. You know, take 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 the profit, and uh, it was a, a nice little way to make some money on the weekends. <laughs> it's a fascinating part of the book, uh, and and really is an education about about 
the ways that young people can make money that you wouldn't you wouldn't think about. The book's title, "Play Nice But Win," uh, you write is something that your mother told you and and other members of your of your family. Um, I was struck by the fact that the the phrase, probably rightly, is "Play Nice But Win." not play nice and win. And I wonder sometimes if you really can do both. And so you've been writing this memoir, looking back on your career. There are moments when it is impossible to, to do both, isn't it? Well, that, that's the idea is to do both, right? And, uh, you know, uh, it's been a, a, a very simple uh, guiding principle for me and can't claim that I've, I've uh, done it with 100% of my actions, but, uh, I think it's generally worked well. And look, I think, um, you know, reputations are built up over a long period of time, can be destroyed very easily. And, you know, having uh, relationships and uh, and in, in integrity in how you operate um, and winning in the right way, these are the things we talk a lot about inside our company for, for uh obvious reasons when you've got a big company it's really important to make it clear kind of what the what the rules are what the standards are and you know play nice but win is something my my parents told my two brothers and I when we would go out and play a ball in the street and it's kind of stuck with me and you know I, I think uh, makes a great title for the book it is it is a good title on the on the back jacket of, of this uh, book cover the Famous actor Matthew McConaughey describes the book as an autobiographical thriller and says that you're a gangster protagonist, not looking for a fight, but relishing every brawl you're in. So I have two questions. First, how did you get to know Matthew McConaughey? What's he like? And second, what does he mean when he when he when he uses that really interesting phrase, gangster protagonist who relishes the brawls that he's in? Well, you know, Matthew is kind of a philosopher king. I don't know if you know this, but uh, you know, he 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 wrote a fantastic book, and he lives, oh, maybe less than a half a mile away from from where where I'm sitting right now in Austin, Texas. So, uh, got to know him as a as a fellow Austinite and as a neighbor. And look, I think uh, you know, as you as you read the book, uh, there's some there's some pretty uh, big brawls that occurred. You know, as uh, I endeavored to buy back all the shares of the company and uh, accelerate the transformation by taking the company private, and we ran into uh, this this character Carl Icahn, who uh, created all all sorts of interesting uh, challenges. And and uh, you know, every book's got to have a, a good villain, and uh, you know, this this certainly has one. <laughs> No, no question about about that. So, uh, the that uh, the story that you just described led me to wonder a couple things. First, why was it so important to you to take the company private? Why was that such a passion? In other words, what are the limitations you saw in being a public company then? And second, why do you still want to be in the saddle? You've done everything. The business leader could do, but but you still want to run the company, and I'm curious why that is. Well, you know, you kind of have to go back to uh, you know the mid 2000s, and you know the company had had a lot of success, but then all sorts of new things started to happen in the industry, and we needed to uh, change and and evolve as as all companies do, and you know we started investing in new areas in software and you know cloud technology and security and building out all sorts of new capabilities and some of that was organic some of that was a series of acquisitions and kind of the more we did that the less the public markets liked it <laughs> and uh, that was pretty frustrating and um, you know kind of sad disappointing uh, you know i described some of you know really what i was feeling during those moments and at one point, it presented a kind of silver lining, which which was, you know, pub, for public companies, transformation is kind of rate limited because, you know, everybody's looking for the the next earnings quarter, you know, the next earnings report, and that sort of thing. And 
back in 2012, 2013, the market really wasn't giving our company permission to accelerate that transformation. So buying back all the sharehold, buying back all the shares and giving the shareholders some of the benefits of our transformation, you know, if it was successful without taking on any of the risk, uh, you know, created this opportunity to really accelerate and go quite a bit faster, which is exactly what we did. And as to why I continue to do this, well, you know, I'm still pretty young. I, I, I feel great. I love what I do. And, you know, when I think about the world that we're in and the role that technology plays in the world in driving human progress and what is about to happen with technology and how everything in the world is becoming intelligent and connected and all this data and AI, uh, mostly for good things, but sometimes not so good, is, is really um, creating a, 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 a fantastic future in, in our world. To me, it's incredibly exciting, and you know, I'd be pretty depressed if I didn't get to be involved in in uh, doing this. We'll get to some of the the bad things or difficult things that are that are happening in, in a minute. But just to stick with your company story for a minute, uh, a key part of this acceleration that you described happened in 2016 when you completed. Uh, what I read is a $67 billion deal to acquire EMC Corporation, the largest uh, technology merger in history. Uh, EMC is a, a data storage, cloud computing related services uh, company, obviously nice to have, but you had to take on close to $50 billion in debt to buy it. And I'm wondering, uh, as you look back, that's now five years ago, uh, whether that uh, strategy seems to be to you to be validated by what happened in the marketplace. Well, it's it's worked out very well, uh, and and uh, you know certainly for our investors in the in the uh, in, in in the various transactions, uh, you know everyone's been been nicely rewarded, um, and the company has built a you know industry leading position in cloud infrastructure and all things technology that help customers, uh, you know, kind of accelerate their digital futures. And, um, you know, what I also observed, and this kind of started uh, in the, you know, mid to late 2000s, was that debt was getting uh, just way less expensive. And of course, that's only continued. Uh, I think Bernanke talked about the savings glut in the mid 2000s. And, you know the cost of of debt capital uh, has just gotten less and less, and you know we've been able to pay down debt at a very aggressive rate. Uh, last week we had a two notch upgrade to investment grade from S and P, so I guess there's a great validation of of uh, of you know our our progress in the transaction. Uh, but yeah, feel feel great about it, and certainly you know debt uh, used smartly. You know, to buy highly productive assets that generate uh, tremendous cash flow, uh, you know, can be a, a great way to, uh, you know, create a lot of value, which is exactly what we've done. And, and at the same time, you know, built uh, a much stronger company to serve to serve our customers. You know, the first half of this year, we had over $50 billion in revenues. We grew 15% uh, in the last quarter. And, you know, second half is going to be very strong as well. So feel, feeling great about the position of the company now, uh, five years after the largest uh, merger acquisition ever in technology. So you've had fantastic uh, success as a, as a businessman, uh, Michael. Forbes currently ranks you as the 23rd wealthiest person in the world, uh, according to them, with about $53 billion. Uh, let me ask an obvious question that people all over America, around the world are asking, which is, do the rich pay enough in taxes, uh, given the, the enormous benefits that they've uh, realized in this economy? Well, you know, I think I think it's 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 a question for policymakers and and uh, and and uh, legislators. 
uh, you know, I, I'm 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 not going to pine on 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 uh, taxes uh, other than to say I, I I pay all my taxes right, and and, and I pay whatever the rate is, uh, you know, and um, and you know let's let's uh, let's let society figure out you know how uh, you know uh, it 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 wants to deal with that, and and uh, you know I'll I'll participate as a as as a citizen like everybody else, and and uh, certainly pay my taxes. But you don't feel as somebody who's who's benefited the session an extraordinary extent. You have a special. Uh, obligation, in effect, to give back to the society where you prospered. Well, you know, uh, that's that sort of uh, goes to how you know my my wife and I have thought about our philanthropy. And uh, some twenty two years ago, we set up a foundation that um, is really focused on children in urban poverty. And really proud of the great work that we've done. And as I mentioned in the book, you know, I think the vast majority of the wealth that I've been able to create uh, will will be dedicated to philanthropy. You know, uh, o- over my lifetime, I hope to spend more time on that in the future. My wife spends uh, a lot of her time on that today. Uh, and so, you know, in, in that sense, yeah, I think it's a I think it's a responsibility. I also think it's an opportunity, right, uh, to use those funds. In a productive and smart way, generating uh, results and outcomes, and uh, really lifting people up. And you know, if you look at what we've done in, in our foundation, uh, you know, super proud of of the various programs in education, in healthcare, and family economic stability, in scholarships, and um, really putting people on a different trajectory in in life. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's there's much more of that in my future to 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 uh, to pursue. So uh, to ask one more uh, a policy question, uh, the tech sector has given all of us uh, just miracles in terms of new uh, uh, equipment, new ways of doing things. But there is a, a growing question in, in America about whether big tech has gotten too big, uh, whether it's become part of the problem uh, in our society uh, uh, rather than part of the solution. So you hear increasingly discussion of, of antitrust uh, law being applied to the, to the tech sector. What, what's your feeling as, as one of the leading uh, tech entrepreneurs and now CEOs uh, about this movement that's clearly out there? Well, again, not a policy expert. I'm not going to try to uh, set policy or, or or figure it out. But look, I think that there are selective roles for governments to play. Uh, you know, as companies accumulate, you know, what society deems to be too much power. You know, I think uh, being big itself is not is not. Uh, uh, you know, shouldn't shouldn't be uh, 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 <laughs> illegal or a crime. And I, I think some one of the judges recently said, you know, being successful is not a crime either. Um, but um, selective, you know, uh, um, intervention, particularly as it relates to, you know, uh, uh, monopoly power, you know, I think has been proven to be effective in uh, in in a in a broad sense and. You know, but again, I'll I'll let the I'll let the the uh, you know uh, government process pl- play out you know on on its own. It's it's not it's not something I I feel like I'm an expert at. Let's take something that's in the news uh, this week, uh, big time, um, and that's the situation that your fellow CEO Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Facebook. Uh, finds himself in after the whistleblower revealed in the Wall Street Journal uh, what are being called the Facebook uh, papers. Uh, I'm curious, uh, as a as a C- CEO who uh, running a, a company has to deal with uh, controversy and issues, what uh, thoughts you'd have for for Zuckerberg as he and Facebook try to respond to this criticism that uh, that in running their social media platform, they ended up um, unintentionally, I'm sure, fostering what amounted to 
to, to, to hate speech or to uh, the problems, social problems that, that uh, uh, we're all concerned about. How, how should Zuckerberg, a, a company like Facebook, uh, deal with this kind of public discussion? Well, it's, it's a difficult um, set of challenges. And, you know, listening to the testimony today, you get um, an appreciation for the challenge. And, uh, you know, I think on, on the one hand, you kind of empathize with, um, you know, uh, creating a set of tools and then, wow, uh, you know, <laughs> they sort of... Uh, uh, end up b being used in ways that you never imagined, and and uh, and you know th that's that's you know not not a great thing. I mean, I think it's also a good reminder that that it's called artificial intelligence for a reason. It's not real intelligence; it's artificial, and it's certainly not wisdom. And um, look, I think uh, you know with the the scale of these social networks. A lot of thought and care has to be put into them to make sure that uh, you know they don't create ill uh, effects. You know, as as uh, you, know, uh, you know, certainly the, the 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 testimony is is pretty compelling. But you know, if Mark calls me, I'm happy to share uh, my my additional thoughts with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious what your own social media life is like do, do, do you spend time on, on facebook or other platforms uh or are you like uh, i think a growing number of americans uh trying to keep your keep your social media profile limited you know i, I i'd say i use it uh as a way of communicating for business and and that's pretty much it i don't do much else uh so you know, been out uh, talking about this new book, and turns out social media is a great way to to promote that. Uh, and look, we have you know millions of customers and hundreds of thousands of team members around the world, and it's a it's an effective way to communicate with many of those audiences. Certainly not the only way, uh, but you know you you won't you won't find me uh, posting pictures of uh, what I'm having for dinner or something like that. <laughs> Uh, I want to ask you about uh, a problem that uh, every CEO has faced over the last year and a half, and that's COVID. And I, I, I'm interested in a couple of things that you think you did uh, that were good for your company and, and employees and your and your customers during this period, and, and maybe some things that uh, that you wish you'd done differently as you look back. You know, first I'll say, uh, you know, every day we just woke up and said, what's the most right thing to do in this situation? And that, you know, guided our, our actions. And, you know, we uh, told everybody not to, not to come in and, and uh, you know, uh, created a, a safe uh, ability for people to do, do their work. I think we injected a fair amount of empathy in the organization and understood that people had different situations at at home and gave them a lot of flexibility and also you know new kinds of support and you know we 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 learned that uh because of of the open culture we have and the new requirements that we found i mean you know uh people have different situations at home right if you got little kids uh, or even not so little kids, right? You're doing homeschooling, you're taking care of them, you've got aging parents, uh, people dealing with all sorts of various challenges, and maybe they didn't even have a great place uh, in their home to do their work, right? And so, um, yeah, I think we had to understand all of those things and at the, at the same time, uh, you know, take care of our, our customers, uh, you know, during, dur dur during, you know, during the crisis. And, and by the way, it's, it's not over, as you know, right? 7.5 billion people, it's a long way to go with this, with this virus. But I do think what is amazing is how much of, how much technology actually worked during this period. And I think we got a kind of leap forward and an acceleration as we saw that, Every aspect of our lives, you know, became intertwined with our 
ability to use technology. And, uh, you know, that's certainly been, uh, you know, eye-opening for, for all of us. And it's been a, a real, uh, you know, tailwind for our business. And I, I think organizations are investing a lot more in technology now because they've seen uh, its power. And, you know, in, in healthcare and education and in all aspects of society. And, you know, uh, as I see it, that's only going to continue to, to, to accelerate. I should say that, that that has been one of the themes of this continuing series, the path forward for the last 18 months that we've been doing it, is the incredible way that technology allowed our economy, our, our society to keep functioning despite this pandemic that for most of us was, was unprecedented. I want to ask you about uh, something that a number of uh, tech companies and other companies have done, which is vaccination mandates. You're based in Texas, where I'm assuming that would be more problematic than some other places. What uh, decision did, did, did Dell make, did you make about uh, vaccination mandates? So, uh, first of all, we're in 180 countries, right? And so, so we we first have to, you know, abide by the the rules in in all those countries, and each one's a little bit different. But uh, for most of the countries, I I think the answer is you get uh, vaccinated, uh, or in some cases, you um, you know uh, show on a on a regular basis that. Uh, you you've had a test and you're you're negative, right? Uh, but uh, you know, for now, uh, here in the United States, we're still working remotely and uh, for for the vast majority of our, of, of of our team members. I want to ask you a, a final question. As you said a moment ago, you're the classic global company, one hundred and eighty different uh, locations around the world. I'm curious whether you think um, global supply chains are going to bounce back uh, to what's needed, to what they were before the pandemic. In some ways, we've seen a story of, of global resilience, but I'm beginning to wonder as I see the ships stacked up at American ports and see increasing delays for some uh, deliveries, uh, whether those supply chains are really as as, as resilient as, as I'd thought. What's been your experience at Dell? Are the things you're really short of that you're worried about having adequate supplies of? What are you doing uh, to make sure your supply chains are robust going forward? But no one is immune from these challenges, and you, you mentioned uh, a number of them. Uh, Look, I, I think the first thing to point out is that we're actually de delivering and shipping more product than we've ever uh, delivered in history. And so even though the demand is uh, quite a lot in excess, uh, the supply is ramping up. Now, it does take time to build the capacity. And I think, you know, roughly five years ago, we started to change uh, our supply chain to be more geographically distributed and to be more resilient. And certainly that resiliency has come into play even more so in the last 18 months. I think it's kind of moved from just in time to just in case. And having a diversified you know, uh, set of factories, you know, roughly 25 around the world, uh, has helped us uh, but we're not immune, and you know uh, our our customers tell us we're generally doing better than than others in our in our sector. But there's not enough supply. It takes a long time. It takes three years to build a new semiconductor factory, and that's where there are uh, quite a few shortages. But there are lots of other shortages in the supply chain, and I think the again this this uh, broad acceleration of technology. Uh, you know, and you look at pretty much any sector uh, of the economy, everything in the world is becoming intelligent and connected, and that's creating all sorts of data. And every industry, in, in a way, is being transformed. And that in itself is accelerating the demand for technology. And, you know, technology is no longer the kind of IT department. It's like uh, the fulcrum of progress for everything that you're doing. And then just around the corner, we have these 
5G telco networks that are coming. That's just going to uh, tremendously accelerate all of this. So we're very excited about that. Uh, you know, a lot of investment is is required to to make that happen, not just in uh, you know global supply chains, but in the infrastructure here in this country and and beyond to support that that future. So, uh, Michael Dell, I want to thank you for being with us. We've come to the end of the 30 minutes that we've got. The, the book is Play Nice But Win. Um, I want to thank you for a uh, fascinating discussion of your company and all the issues that are re related to it. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, David. Great to be with you. So uh, please uh, come back and join us for our other programming. I'll be on later this afternoon talking to uh, one of our top cybersecurity officials in the Biden administration uh, to see what we've got coming on Washington Post Live. Go to WashingtonPostLive.com and register for our programming. Thank you for joining us today.